questions. Uh, so this last week I had some really weird uh, dream in the afternoon, during my afternoon nap. Mm -hmm. So the, it was somewhat like an infinite loop kind of thing. An infinite loop? Where, yeah. Okay, those are fun. It felt, where, like, it felt like I was awake, lying on the bed, yet when I tried to get up, for some reason, it looped back to me being on the bed again. I kept trying my best to get out of my bed, and yet, I like walked back again on my bed. And I don't know how I escaped, all of a sudden I did some movement or something and suddenly I woke up and I realized I was in a dream. Excellent. Excellent. Now, is that the whole dream? Yeah. And okay. It so was scary because... say, say it again and give me the details this time. Start from the beginning, give all the details you can and tell, uh, tell me how you felt during that time. Okay. So, yeah, so what I felt was there was some actual dream prior to this. I don't remember that much, but finally what it arrived at was I was like it started off this whole afternoon nap started off after lying on my bed. Mm -hmm. And when the dream almost, dream almost ended, mm -hmm. it felt like I woke up from the from my bed. Yet, in reality, I haven't woken up. I was still in the dream. It was so realistic that I felt that I have woken up from and I tried moving. That's like fantastic. That's fantastic, physically. man. That's fantastic. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So I tried getting up physically inside that dream. Mm -hmm. Yet, every instance I tried it walked back again me like walked me back again to the lying position on the bed like i kept trying and for some reason i ended up on the bed again and again and it felt suffocating and scary because it felt i was in a infinite loop that okay. i will never be able to get out of this okay okay now when you were in the dream did you see yourself or did you see the room or did you see the bed or did you just have the feeling? I, I, I saw myself through, through a first perspective, like through my own eyes. Okay, through your own eyes. Like, okay. All right. I was lying on the... Have you been trying to lucid dream? At all? I tried sometime, but not much after like reading, reading a bit of Journey to Islam. Not much. Well, this is this is superb because you're getting very close to so so we could go into the sleep physiology and uh, sleep phys uh, preservation and and the things that the body does in order to preserve sleep, but this doesn't sound so much like the content of your dream. It sounds like the dream itself was that of awakening, and then uh, but not awakening, thinking you were getting up but you weren't getting up and you go back to sleep. How many times did this cycle? I don't remember. I think it was five, six. Whoa, that's fantastic. So why is that scary to you? Because I thought it will keep on happening and I will never get out of this. Like, hey. I've... <clears throat> Go ahead. Like, I've heard of, like, time dilation in dreams where, like, I don't know. Like Mohammed, when Mohammed had a, a, a picture fell from the side of his bed, and by the time it hit the floor, he had, he had dreamed seven years in another place, or something like that, is that what you mean? Yes, exactly. Okay. Why would that scare you? How do you know you're not in one of those now? <laughs> I don't I, mean to scare you, but how do you know you're not in one of those now? I don't know, and I may be, but to be honest, I'm fine with it because I'm used to this. And to be honest... No, nothing is difficult once not... you're used to it. Forgive me, I just have to yeah. share that little bit of wisdom from the... Uh, I can't remember if it's the Sufis or the, or the U.S. Marine Corps. I can't forget, but it's 
nothing is difficult once you're used to it. May I use this uh, opportunity to share with folks the, the dream of Chang Su? Yeah, yes. All right, so let me do that. Is here. it that butterfly one? Yes, but I think it's particularly well written here. If I can just find it, so let's see. Okay, here we go. Okay, so in the second half of this book, which I'm reading from in another series, the second half of this book, the longer part of the book is the Chang Su, uh, C H U A N G Su T Z U, uh, another masterful, uh, that's another masterwork of of uh, Taoism. And this is the famous uh, <coughs> Chang Su butterfly story. Once Chang Chu dreamed he was a butterfly. He was happy as a butterfly, enjoying himself and going where he wanted. He did not know he was Chu. So let me do that again a little bit better. Once Chang Chu dreamed he was a butterfly. He was happy as a butterfly, enjoying himself and going where he wanted. He did not know he was Chu. Suddenly he awoke, whereupon he was startled to find he was Chu. He didn't know whether Chu had dreamed he was a butterfly, or if a butterfly were dreaming it was Chu. But as Chu and the butterfly, there must be a distinction. This is called the transformation of beings. Okay, so I just share that because, so these kinds of, of uh, opportunities, although they may be scary to some people in the beginning, you're going to cherish them later because they can teach you a lot. So now, when you were in your dream, did you really want to wake up or did you really want to sleep? That's, that's a good question. Initially, I just wanted to wake up. Uh, are you sure? Were you time. the butterfly? Or you, were you true? Did you really want to wake up? Or did you really want to sleep? So initially, I would have said, I would have preferred sleeping, but I have other things to do as well. Who would have preferred time. sleep? Who would have preferred sleeping? I and who would have preferred waking? Certainly, I mostly because I got scared of this. I got scared that I but, will be in this. Thing. Right, but the one that got scared was he. Was he the one that wanted to sleep, or was he the one that wanted to wake up from the dream? I would argue that he wanted to wake up. And why would you? Why would you argue that? Because that's what your mind told you. Yeah. So you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna believe what your mind tells you, not necessarily what your body tells you. That's what most people do. To, I mean, you know. But is that what you're telling me? So let me. There's a there's a Sufi tale that that illustrates this slightly in a slightly different manner, but it's a good good story. I hope I don't butcher it. The Mullah Nasruddin is a joke figure that's used for teaching by the Sufis. And uh, he's a, he's kind of a a wise fool, let's say. Uh, he plays the role some of, the, of say the court jester or something like that. So he he through his through his uh, adventures and and misadventures and inanities, etc. He teaches us about our own mind. At any rate, uh, the mullah was at home one day, and a neighbor came and knocked and says, "Mullah, uh, can I borrow your donkey?" The mullah opens the door and the neighbor says, Hey, mullah, can I borrow your donkey? And the mullah says, Oh, I'm sorry, my, I, my donkey's not here. I, I loaned him to my cousin. And uh, just then in, in the backyard, they hear this brain, bah! however, a donkey, I don't do donkeys very well. There's a brain of a donkey. And the neighbor says, Mullah, how can you tell me that you're, you're, you loaned your, your donkey to your cousin. I just heard your donkey brain in the backyard. And the mullah says, 
who are you going to believe me or a donkey okay so so there so now who are you going to believe your mind or your body in a case like this honestly depends on the situation to be honest correct but in this situation you were believing your mind because you were going to be late for something is that right yes essentially yes yeah but your body loves that sleep so much it feels so good oh. it feels so nice to get there and just like oh and so so you were split half of you wanted to sleep and half of you wanted to wake up or something like that but you chose to believe one instead of the other how come uh, fear at least mindset that if i don't get things done did, and, did your body feel the fear I, did you have a heart fast a fast heart rate or were you breathing hard or anything like that it was mild initially, but when this infinite loop thing started, then I started getting panicky and at least in the dream it felt like that. Okay. Well, you know, fear is extra in a situation like this, so you don't need that. But you know, if you ever have that situation again, look for your right hand because it sounds like you're in, in the proper configuration to begin lucid dreaming. And once you have lucid dreaming, you can do all kinds of extraordinary things. I know that doesn't take away the memory of the fear, but fear is a habit, just like courage. And so maybe part of this is to help you cultivate courage. Now, if you're going to be late <coughs> and the headmaster is going to beat you or your boss is going to beat you with a stick when you get there, well, then maybe you should have some fear. But I wouldn't be too worried about that. And of course, <coughs> you could set an alarm or something like that. But that would defeat this wonderful circumstance that you found yourself in. You can look yeah. for your hand or you can talk to your body and say, hey, I want to wake up. Or your body can say to your mind, not on buddy, you're just going to stay right here and keep dreaming. One of the things that we discovered about dreams, I mean, we've probably known this for much, much longer. The interpretation of dreams did not start in Europe at the turn of the, of the the 20, 20th century by Freud, although, frankly, that's how I was taught. The interpretation of dreams goes back to the Egyptians, probably the Sumerians, and probably further than that. And of course, the Sufis uh, are masters of this, as they are many things psychological. Mm -hmm. So, so is that okay? I mean, do you do you want to? I mean, fear is just fear. It comes, it goes. If there was something to be afraid of, that would be different. Then you would need to act. But this is just fear that your your mind created to b combat with your to fight with your body. Yeah. And again, yeah. you don't know. Frankly, you do not know whether you're Chu or the butterfly. But there must be a or distinction. Maybe something else. Yes, sir. Entirely. Hmm. I'm just saying, or maybe something else entirely than butterfly or me that streaming things. Oh, that's interesting. Like what? I don't know. The uh, Toltecs called the mind a foreign installation. See, because we, in our natural state, as we were before, you know, civilization, or as we were before we, you know, grew up as an individual child, we can talk about a collective civilization or we can talk about a child. But before we had conceptual thought and language, before we had all this elaborate mind stuff, words, concepts, constructs, ideas, uh, opinions, mental opinions, etc., like that, we lived in a pure, undifferentiated state of awareness. And then the price of developing that conceptual thought is to, to, uh, create all kinds of problems for ourselves in terms of our mental suffering. That's where 99% of 99.9% .9 of suffering comes from is the mind. So at any rate, it sounds like you, you, you had an opportunity, you got something out of it, but next time try and look for your, your right hand. All right. And if you find it, then open and close it. And now, and then when you do that, you go, Oh, wow, I'm lucid dreaming. And that's how it happens. Just like that. And sometimes after doing that, it can be good for that. So good for you. Just keep going.
An infinite loop. Yes, yeah. we are. We are in an infinite loop, but there's no time, so I wouldn't worry too much about that, right? So everything is right now. Mind. Everything is now. We can't find yes. the, the past. Is, okay, so what are we really? We're, we're memories, sensations, perceptions, fantasies about the future. The fantasies about the future and the memories are just thoughts, so we can call that thoughts. And the perceptions are just sensations, so we have thoughts and perceptions. That's that's it. And they all occur. I mean, they all occur in the present. They can occur in the past, and they can occur in the future. So everything is now, the instant now. This is what Eckhart Tolle talks about, or Krishnamurti talks about, when they when uh, Eckhart talks about, you know, be here now. You know, the famous Ram Das quote or, or be presence that's the word he uses for the for the for God actually presence the presence and Krishnamurti talks about have you ever seen a tree have you ever you know we're, we're it's it's the we have to stop looking at the things of mind and the things of mind are all in time right and so when he says Krishnamurti says to look at reality he's saying look right here right now and that you have to start there you can't do anything in the past or the present except talk about it or fantasize about it. Okay, but sir. Like even, like even, isn't even thinking about something is also being done in the now itself, right? Like you can't physically move. Thinking there occurs the in the past, always about. in the past. But that you can imagine it's about the future. Go ahead. Now, right? Go ahead, I'm sorry. But that, but that thinking itself is occurring right now. No, thinking it's in the past. of the past and future. No, it's thinking. Well, it's more or less now. It's in the window of now. Let's say, but whatever it is you're thinking about, it may, it may be the future. It may be the past. And we won't get into the neurobiological details, but there's reasons why we can't even be in the present. Actually, we can't even find the present, frankly. But but those are details. That's that's too esoteric for this this level of discussion. But if you but if you look at your thoughts, that regardless of whether they're of the past or the future, they all occur only now, and that's what Krishnamurti and Eckhart Tolle and uh, many other people try and point us to, right? Yes. And of course, so, the Taoists uh, are all over that. The Taoists are all over that. Okay, sir. Yeah. yeah so I have some different question. Different questions. Yep. So, like, do let me know what your thoughts are. Okay. What I observed during my awareness process is, like, whenever I'm doing something, there is a sudden signal inside of me that says to be aware of what's going on. And then my mind basically backtracks and tries to find a, some coherent story about what is happening right now excellent good like, observation is this what being called aware being aware is like that that is that just the interrupt signal that we call awareness is and isn't that interrupt signal being sent itself a conditioning that i am conditioning myself to Okay, Basically, let me see if I understand what you're at. Try to ask it again more simply for me. Yeah, sorry. So uh, I wanted to ask, what is the awareness process? What I observed is uh, the awareness process starts. The what process? By some the what? The, okay, the, the awareness, awareness process starts. Being aware. Okay, starts with yeah. what? starts with some certain signal or something that comes into my mind that basically says be aware of what's going on now good excellent and then whenever my mind receives that signal a movement of thoughts start up that try to create some coherent view of what's going on right now of what kind of view a coherent a coherent view okay a coherent view so first you have the, the start where there's a signal that says be aware. And then you have an yep. a, a activation of thought. And it says what again? A movement of thought. And what does it say? 
uh, just it tries to come up with some coherent view about what okay coherent view right okay now. good 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 excellent okay but one question is isn't this itself a conditioning like when is that interrupt signal being called isn't that itself a conditioning when you say interrupt signal do you mean the start signal yeah the start signal okay so let's use the word start signal and is it that yes. conditioning yeah, yeah, it's, and it's thought too. So this is this is beautiful because what we're talking about here is what Krishnamurti refers to all the time when he's talking about the movement of thought and how we must not get caught in the flow and the river and the stream and the in the you know the the movement of thought because once we're in the movement of thought we're we've lost it. But see, you you've been doing some meditation. It sounds like because this is real progress. You are uh, noting that even in the process of trying to be aware you, you it starts with a signal okay I, got, I need to be aware I need to be aware right and then let's see what happens there's I can't read my writing oh there's a coherent thought there's a the movement of, of a coherent thought you try then you try to find a thought about okay is this awareness something like that is that yes. Correct? Okay. So, Honestly, you, you, even though you're trying to be aware, what you're aware of is thought. The start signal, as you call it, and the movement of thought to create a coherent uh, vision or a coherent picture. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. So now, what's your question? So, uh, one thing though, that start signal, right? Okay. I would argue it's more like a non-conceptual signal. Ah, like, good. There is no words, nothing, no thing associated with it. It's, it's just a signal. I don't know. Start signal. And you're just calling it a signal because like, you don't have any other way to describe it. Yes. Is that what yes. you're saying? Okay, good, 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 good. Excellent. All right. So, um, what if we got I'm rid of the start you. signal altogether? if you can and just like so you're walking along one day and then all of a sudden you realize oh wow I'm awake I'm aware something like that yeah okay so we can get rid of the start signal but the minute you think I'm aware then you try and put some kind of coherent verbal or conceptual frame around it is that right yes okay yes, yes. okay beautiful so this is, is this what awareness process is like? This is the process of learning. And this is a beautiful example of someone learning, sincerely learning, or trying to learn how to master their mind. And so what you're going through is the most difficult part because <coughs> it's very hard to imagine, excuse me. <coughs> Forgive me. <coughs> it's very hard to imagine how to get out of this trap because the mind just starts automatically, right? Yeah. And I, I noticed something similar during problem solving as well. So like when someone asks you a mathematical question or anything okay. that involves solving something. Problem solving, including mathematical? Yeah. When you try to explain a solution, like you already know what solution is. You already know a non-conceptual understanding of what the solution would be. Well, you do because you're a so, math whiz, right? But the rest of us don't. Not necessarily. Not necessarily math whiz, but like, right. math, like Better not than necessarily most, just say. related to math itself. Okay. Like any problem solved. All right. Anything organization related as well or anything okay like it's like you know the solution already but conceptual things arise because of communication yes you need so to explain it to somebody else conceptualization just a necessity is it what uh, so what I wanted to say is like to communicate what I have come up with, whatever this non-conceptual solution is, 
that's where conceptualization of things arise. Yes, like, and it's very it's necessary for that, uh, except for certain circumstances. In the circumstance of love, true love, and true communi uh, reciprocal connection, then you can transfer, you can share thoughts without getting into the conceptualization or the word thing. There's just a mind-to-mind -mind transmission. I mean, that happens with love, right? With real love. But other than that, yeah, you got to put it in words or you're not going to be able to communicate the solution to anybody else. Right? Got it. Yeah, yeah so this is, we, this we're not throwing away the mind. What we're doing is we're putting the mind to the side and, and we're becoming the masters of the mind rather than the mind mastering us. Okay, so so we're able to observe the mind in action, but we don't get on, it's, it's like the mind is a train and thoughts are a train or, you know, and, and we just don't get on the train. Now, if you need, if you're at work and you need to explain a problem, the solution to a problem to somebody, you definitely have to get on the train and figure out the words and, and you know, like I'm trying to do here. But, so, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to ask, who solves it? Who solves the problem at all? If it's given to me all of a sudden. What's the problem? Here we have to be more concrete. Yeah. My okay. For example, I would simply go with some mathematical problem. You are solved with suppose you are asked to solve some integration, and then your mind automatically knows what technique to use to solve this. Absolutely so beautiful. Who knows. Okay, so what let me let me technique. Let me let me see if I can help with this. You're a student of computers, I'm a student of the human body. And so I know that in the kidney cell, in the kidney, there are these cells and they're called osmotic receptors or something like that. And they're able to measure the amount of salt in the, in the blood. And they can measure a lot of other things too, the amount of potassium, the amount of salt and, and a bunch of other uh, ions. <clears throat> now, they have the problem that let's say someone drinks uh, uh, some salt water or something like that, or somehow or another they've been eating a lot of salty food, a lot of salted popcorn, let's say, and the salt levels in the blood are starting to go up. Now this kidney cell, one cell or a tissue, let's call it the kidney tissue, has to solve the problem. Okay, I have to excrete some of this, but I have to hold on to some of this. And I know that where I want to keep the, the salt level, I know the osmolality of the blood I want, I want it to be. I know the salinity of the blood. I, I know how, how much sodium should be there and how much should not be there. But hey, if I fall down on the job, this guy's sodium level is going to go up and he's going to have a cardiac arrhythmia or something like that. So this cell in the kidney or this group of cells in the kidney, they get this problem sent down to them and say, hey, we got a big, huge salt load, you know, and, and it's mixed with some acid because this guy's been drinking orange juice too. So now we have a, a, a hyper acidic, uh, slightly lower pH and, and we have a, uh, or something like that. And we have a higher uh, salt concentration. What are we going to do? How much of this, how, how much of this should we send to the bladder to be peed out? Right. Or how much should we hold on to? Because we need that. We need some too. And they're also having to pay attention to the fa how the fact that this guy's breathing. The more you breathe, you blew off CO2 and you become alkalotic, I think, or acidotic. I don't remember the details right now. They're not important. But the point is, is that they have to, to somehow or another figure out the acidity, the pH, the salinity, the how much sodium, how much potassium, and how much of other ions to get rid of or to hold on to, to send to the bladder to be peed out. So who solves that problem? I thought it was basic chemistry, like a mechanical in nature because of this balance of... Can you think of a chemical that... system that could do that? Measure the temperature, the pH, the oxygen saturation, the alkalinity, I mean the uh, salt concentration, the potassium, and then hold on or let go of salt, depending on that, you'd be able to desalinate anything. But I mean, you don't have any machine that does that? Well, there is the dialysis machine, but that's a complicated machine. So let's say the dialysis machine does it. Who solved that problem? Someone who closely interacted with a lot of 
patient who had kidney failure and no they don't do they don't do it they hooked the person up to the machine that's the whole point the machine can solve the problem the kidney can solve the problem but the human can't solve the problem the mind can't solve the problem the human this mind the one that we presume is up here can't solve that problem but the mind the, the somebody's down there in the kidney deciding all this stuff dealing with the problem and maybe even talking to their neighbors saying hey we gotta we gotta step up the pace here we got to get rid of this extra sodium so in that case who would you say solved the problem it automatically solved itself or happened a it's, solution it's not automatic man it's not automatic if your kidneys aren't working right you will you will die i'm overstating it you know there's backup systems but, but, but the point is, is would we give an i to the kidney would we give a you know the letter i would we say it has a self because it's solving problems? I don't know. Good, that's perfect. Honestly, so this is, this is 21st century biology now. We're starting to realize that these different tissues have minds of their own. And cancer, for example, definitely has a mind of its own because it decides it's going to live in your body, whether it's helpful or not. It only wants for itself to survive. And so by understanding now the minds of these tissues, because look, it has to look at a situation, it has to define the problem, it has to solve the problem, it has to make choices, and it has to have goals. And what is a mind other than that? Uh, I would argue all these things are just conceptualizations of things. Okay. The kidney and all won't even think about it, like they just do it. Okay, great. That's even better. They just do it. They don't even need to think about it. They just do it. Now, yeah. would you need to think about it if you really understood something completely? Or could you just do it? Let's say you want to catch a fish and it's shallow water. And these fish don't swim very fast. They're like in the canals that kids play in. Could you reach your hand in and grab a fish if you wanted to? Yeah, you could. I don't think so. Well, you could, you could. I, I, okay. I did it as a kid. So, so, yeah, you get just get used to it. You can, you can grab them fast. You can, humans are pretty fast in the wild. I mean, reasonably fast. <clears throat> as long as you don't cast a shadow and the fish doesn't know you're coming, you can grab them real quick. Some fish in shallow water. Yep. So my point is that do you need to think to do that? Something's thinking, something's calculating like crazy. It's calculating, okay, how big is the fish? How big do my fingers have to get? If it's gonna swim that way, how do I grab it? You know, how do I lead? How do I, you know, and bears do this, cats do this in the wild, right? Yeah, it is that they don't need Wikipedia page for it. No, they don't need Wikipedia for that. They just do it. So now let's go back to your issue, okay? And let's see if we can, we can because the question is problem solving. And you're saying you need you need the verbal to solve the problem. And that's why I want to know what the problem is. We know that you need the verbal to communicate with someone else, but you need the verbal for the rest of it. I don't know. I don't know what the problem is. Let's find out. My problem is, like, uh, my core problem is, like, after someone asks a question, how do we arrive at a solution? Like, the solution to what? Happens. The solution to what? Solution to the problem. Solution to the, to the problem that is being asked. Okay, let's say it's a hot day, right? And there's okay. you're you're out in the field, but in the middle of the field, there's also a tree, a big tree, big beautiful oak tree, and under that tree, shadow. My brother's here. He's trying to pitch in. He's trying to, okay. Yeah, he says, why don't you just walk under the tree and get in the shade and cool off? Do you need to think to do that? do that? So that solves that problem. No. So I gave you a concrete problem. I gave you the solution. I show how you could, a you or an animal or a beautiful crow can just go and, and stand in the shade to solve the problem of there being too much heat. Now, 
let's look at your problem and see what it requires. Because not all problems are the same, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like, so what's the problem? Okay. The uh, problem here is someone giving you a maths question, an integration problem, and you arriving at an approach to solve it without thinking of any other approaches. And suddenly, when you like verbalize it, when you conceptualize it, so that you can communicate it with others, you know you have correctly solved the problem. So that first step, the realization that what needs to be done to solve this problem, how does one arrive at that? That's what. Okay, so let's. Question. So this is. There's an integration of a function, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's going to take calculus. Yeah. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be several different variables. Yes. Right. So, so do you ever watch baseball? Yes. So let's say uh, the batter, uh, the second batter, and there's a man on first base and a man on third base. I'm just making this up. I'm not an expert. He bunts, okay? <clears throat> and and it's such a short. You know what a bunt is? The ball doesn't go very far. Okay. Yeah, and it's you know it's the, the bottom of the I don't know the second inning, and the the. Uh, catcher has to grabs the ball and he has to throw it to the center fielder okay or no let's make it simpler the guy hits a, a, a beautiful fly ball and the, he, the ball goes up in the air like this right and the center fielder is looking at his ball he's going oh you know and he's got to catch it now that ball is moving at a certain speed it's moving in a certain trajectory it's moving there's a certain amount of wind there's a, a, the light that's in the way, I mean, the sunlight or whatever. How does he do this integrated function? He doesn't do it. It just happens. Maybe. It just it's happens? I mean, he just catches the ball? I mean, this, this is a fast, hard ball. And it's flying through the air, and there's a lot at stake. It just happens? I would say he practiced it a lot. So he was programmed to be able to catch it. But how can you be programmed? You never know where the ball's going to go. You never know what the wind's going to be. You never know. You know. You, I mean, yeah, he's able to do it. But okay, then forget that. Let's say a dog and a frisbee. A dog's never seen a frisbee. You toss it like this. You've got to integrate this. This. Uh, whatever you call it. What do you call that? I'm not a mathematician. You've got to integrate that function. You've got to calculate everything. You've got to lead the, the Frisbee, and he's got to jump at just the right time to where he can jump up and grab the Frisbee and be all happy. Who does that? I think the dog may have faced such similar situation. It may not, its ancestors may have. It could simply be have been like hunting something. Hunting a bird. It's somewhat similar to like catching a Frisbee, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. something moving in direction so that dog or that person may have just said that okay then let's take a dog that's never been, let's take a dog that's never been swimming and let's just throw him in a pool now he's got to integrate his buoyancy and how much to, how fast to paddle and what to paddle and to paddle and which way to face and what to do with his tail he's never been in that situation who solves that problem I would argue this would be somewhat like it could have been solved by some of his ancestors and passed down as genes to be able to do these things. Oh, excellent. Okay, so so it's programmed into the dog. Where? Yeah. In his genes. That makes some sense because there's some dogs that really, you know, love the water. There's some dogs that are natural born retrievers. There's some dogs that are natural born something or other. Okay. So you're going to say it was solved by the ancestors. So your problem, why can't we say that your problem has got to be solved by the, your ancestors? It could be. I would, yeah. Okay, so be. the ancestors. Now, how did the ancestors solve it? 
through their own ancestors and through their own experiences. Okay, all right. How far back does that go? I don't know. It depends. It could totally be like totally desperate things, yet conceptually they could be similar. Right. So, for example, our ancient ancestors, if we want to go down this path, why not? It's, it's kind of fun. So we watched a cheetah catch a, a gazelle and we thought, hmm, those gazelles look tasty. How are we going to catch one? Well, I guess we got to run too, just like the cheetahs. And we noticed that the wolves, when they come, they come in these kind of groups. And so we learn from the animals, right? Yeah. But who do the yes. animals learn from? Environment. Yeah, maybe. So the point is that to solve these, to talk about these things, we really do. This is contemplation, by the way. What we're illustrating is contemplation. It's nothing magical, mystical. It's, it's like just thinking. Okay, so we have a problem to solve. A kidney has a problem to solve. A baseball player and a and a and a frisbee dog has a problem to solve. A big fish has a problem to solve. And somehow or another, these things get done, and there's not necessarily the, the eye in the middle of it. The kidney, I wouldn't say that the yeah. kidney has itself. Would you? No. So we by habitually insert this self this eye in the middle of everything when it as often as not it kind of gets in the way you know it is because it it's only honestly waste of time there like you go so conceptualizing things so what the Taoists really would say slow. the Taoists would say you solve it by not doing you don't get all involved you just do it you just walk over to the shade underneath that oak tree in the middle of the field. <coughs> it's, forgive me. <coughs> and it's cooler. Simple. Simple, simple, simple. And you'd be amazed if you have spent some time cultivating yourself with a few books and teachers and... and masters of the craft you know like they used to do in the old days there was apprentices and all mm -hmm. kinds of programs where, where young men and women they, they followed a, a master around and they learned from them and they learned by watching they learned by doing they learned how to you know carry the bricks and then they learned how to mix the mortar then they learned how to put the bricks together and before you know it they know how to build a house well we've lost that in the modern world but something like that can still be done and should be done before the AIs come in and uh, eat our lunch. So by not doing everything gets done. Just ask the kidney. Okay. Ask the kidney, ask a dog, ask a fish. Ask my brother out here, the, the raven. Okay, sir? Okay. Yeah. So now a different question. I'm sorry? So I was uh, a different question. I ask a different question mm -hmm. uh, so the question is I was trying to observe my real self through self itself I tried doing it like I first thought of try observing something that's uh, not your real self <laughs> go ahead go yeah ahead. I thought like suppose theoretically if there is a possible to have a replica of myself that is always near me and if there is some like, there is I one it's called the double ask, go ahead go ahead yeah if there is a double always near me so i can just ask them what they are feeling so that way i kind of can observe them as a real self but again asking them would again involve loss of information because a lot of things get thrown away when just you're making a lot of assumptions. Yes. You're making a lot of assumptions. So tell me about this double you're talking about. That's the thing. Like it's exactly same as me. Yes. But it can never be same as me because. Who's talking now? Because you or the double? That, that's just me. No, that's the double. Or I, I, I presume it's the double. The, your, this du my double is talking to you now. 
that's what even I arrived at. Like, like there you go, good, good, if, good. Like, if there is a replica of me, then it has to live outside of me. Like, in no, a who said that? Place, who said it had to live space. outside of you? Who said the 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 other has outside or inside or any of those things? Like, if it lives inside me, then how can I differentiate myself? With what is inside that you? Does it live inside the double? I suppose in a way. But that's just, this, I mean, you know, okay. But it also lives outside the double too. Like, then I thought of, is there any other way to do that? To do what? What needs to be done? To, like, to have something that can reflect my real self so that I can observe my real self. Just but, don't, don't, oh, that's a good question. Let's see. When you leave the double and find yourself, you won't be interested in inhabiting yourself. You'd be much more interested in the freedom that the, the, the other, the real you has in the, in, in, in the universe and the power and the understanding and the, and the just, it's unspeakable. What the real you is made of. I think this is what I, I, not exactly this is what I arrived at. Like what I arrived at is that, like even if I were to find some way to have something that reflects my real self, that will always everything be reflects past. your real self. Yeah, that's all it is—is is a reflection of the real self. The, yeah, the, yeah. Go ahead. But my thing was like, whenever I try to observe something outside myself, like in this case, observing my reflection as some of my outside surroundings, I'm just observing. The They're not your reflection. Why did you say your reflection are like you're a mirror or something? Okay, so I thought uh, it was just a theoretical question in the sense that if there is a way to have something that reflects myself fully. Basically, I just arrived at that in either space or in time, I can never have a way to observe my real self. Not if you're going to hold on to space and time in that way. You're right. I think we're getting a little bit deep here. I think we're getting a little bit deep for it, and we're going to have to clarify a lot of terms, etc. But but your 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 true self, your real self is uh, outside of space and time. It's immortal. It's, I you know, can't really speak of it, but I can just say that much, I guess. It's painful to speak about it because anything you say just reduces it. And it's, anything you say is kind of like the opposite. It's really so, incredible, this life. Just so unbelievable. So mysterious, so miraculous too. But go ahead, let's keep trying for a bit. What I arrived at was like to know the real self, I need to be the real self. You already are the like, real self. No, 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 you don't need to add something. You need to get rid of something. That's vitally important. You already are the real self. The, the the double is this idea that you have of yourself, this this a notion of, of this concept concept that you have of, of yourself and all this other stuff. That's you don't need any of that stuff. So so in this process of awakening, you do not add anything. You take things away, yeah. and then so, then someday it just all drops away, and then you go, oh well, that's obvious, I suppose. Uh, and you'll never be the uh, same. Again. You'll never be the same again. In a very yeah, good way. Like, Go ahead. No, basically, I just I thought like this was just a thought experiment by me about can I like observe my real self through real self. So I tried some strategies and I don't know. I feel like there is no way to observe my real self through some third party thing like. I am that thing. I can't observe it. No, because you're getting in your own way. 
and see but what you're doing is you're making really good progress because you're trying sincerely that's what it seems like to me you're actually doing the experiments yourself and you must do the experiments yourself because you don't know which one's going to open the door for you and so this this sincerity this dedication to the to the project this this uh dedication of intent that's what's going to do it and in some magical mysterious mysterious way it's those who are sincere only and if you look if you look at name any any mystic that 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 woke up suddenly and every one of them was a sincere person well if they weren't before they certainly were after but in general that's i think that's true so the point is, is that this is the process you keep working at it you keep thinking about it you keep trying to figure out well wait a minute what do they mean here and, and like today you learn you're not trying to find something outside of yourself you're not trying to get something you're trying to get rid of something because the thing that obscures your vision is the pre the attachment to concepts that's why the buddhists say attachment is a root of suffering attachment to concepts is the root of suffering and so we're de very attached to our concepts because they you know our parents taught them to us and we need them for work and and we've been spending all our life learning them and it's in language our lam language creates these concepts without language it would be much easier right but 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 things yeah. like like numbers those are, are concepts and they, they seem so logical and so reasonable and so important and so vital and in a certain kind of way i guess they are for civilization or whatever if we're going to be this complicated about civilization however that's what stands in the way yeah honestly even i feel like that that subject verb object thing basically separates the subject and object a lot very of good and excellent okay see now that's a huge breakthrough if you can really grok that that the language itself creates the subject and object that we are prisoners of syntax we are prisoners of our language this is like like in english we have he her and it those are our three choices so now we're we're, we're just stuck in there right we don't have a language yeah. of, of gradations. We don't have a language of uh, something beyond uh, gender. We don't have a language of... of and so our, our language turns into our prison. Okay? Because language is just nothing but a series of concepts. And so when you, you'll get beyond language, and when you do that... And this is why the Zen, the Zen guys, you the koans, I've been reading more Zen lately, uh, because they break language. And then all you need is the right break at the right time, you know, and it's and the window's there and, it, and it's open for a moment and then it closes again. But if you can, if it's there and you recognize, oh my God. But meanwhile, as you progress, you're making real progress because no matter what happens or when, isn't your life getting better? Yes. Okay, well then, Yes. good, 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 good. Okay, we're gonna to have to stop for today. Anything last before we stop? Uh, I had a question like, what is beauty? But what is beauty? Yeah. Beauty is truth. But like from my perspective, it feels like whenever we see something beautiful, it's just through our conditioning. How much do you, how much do you, how much do you know math? Would you say that there are certain uh, mathematical constructs or equations or formulations or objects that are beautiful yeah but I okay no no the, the, stop idea. stop stop so you can recognize beauty in math there there are some things that are beautiful yes. and some things that are ugly there are some equations that are beautiful yeah yes now which is more likely to be true a beautiful equation or an ugly equation beautiful of course because it's true so but I, I know that's a very crude, you know, it's, it's like a little, uh, you know, it's a little trinket they give you when you go to the, I don't know, when you go to a party and they give you a little party favor. But, but that points in the right direction. So as painters and poets and scientists know, truth and beauty are the same thing. But then at another level, because there are no words to describe the beauty of the truth and the power and the understanding and, and the just the... See, words just fail. But who is it? Uh, 
truth is beauty and beauty is truth. That's all you know and that's all you need to know. Was that Wordsworth? Now that's speaking of a man, that, that's spoken by a man who, who, who has limited himself by saying that's all you need to know. But yeah, beauty. Now, if you read David Deutsch, he, he's, he's, trying to, he's trying to grab this because he's a philosopher, scientist, whatever. He's the father of quantum computing. He says that beauty is to be found in nature in symmetries and in certain harmonic relationships with one another, like the golden section, for example, or, or you see seashells, or you see sunflowers, or you see uh, hermit crabs wrapped in these certain kind of spiral that, that corresponds to the Fibonacci uh, sequence. Yeah. And that ratio is, is universally considered beautiful. So we, we're struck in this extraordinary situation where God has given it, or God, she has given us or the Tao, or whatever, the power, the presence, the way, whatever, it's the words never make, never sound right. But it's given us these huge clues. It's not like, at the same time, the secret protects itself, it hides itself. I mean, it feels deliberate in a way, but at the same time, it gives us dreams so we can study our consciousness. It gives us these beautiful ratios in nature so we can learn our mathematics. It, it, it embeds, for all I could, I don't know, do you think math is uh, in, uh, discovered or invented? That's a good question. Well, if you look, at, the, if you look at some of the things discovered. in nature, it looks like they're pretty much discovered, right? Yeah. But I don't know yeah. either, I'm not a mathematician. And then we have all these clues lying all around the place for us to just pick up. So it's like, could you design a life more beautiful and, and mysterious and, and wonderful and, and also full of horrors and, and, and all kinds of other things as well if we get lost in our minds? But, but truly, like the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Muslims say, uh, Allah, the, the merciful, the compassionate, or the, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much says it right there. But in addition to that, If you refer to it as something outside yourself, you say, I don't want to say the word it. It's wrong. He's wrong, obviously. She's wrong, obviously. It conceals itself and reveals itself at the same time. And it, and, and, and it gives us a life of, of meaning and purpose to, to solve this mystery of why we're here, what we're made of, where we're going, where we come from. And it's all there, but it's like so demanding, but in a very mysterious way, because very simple people can also access this. And in many ways, they may have advantages because they aren't all lost in their conceptual thought. So we should stop there, unless there's one, one last question, but, but what is beauty? Beauty is truth, and truth is love. I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't. I didn't write these rules, but that's the truth. Yeah. Beauty is love. Truth is beauty. And in in truth, love is all there is. Okay, sir. Last question. Yes. Uh, no. That's okay. Fair. Okay. Well, take good care. You're making good progress. Keep on trucking. This is how it happens. You just keep working. Keep working, and you'll see that your life. You start to get lighter you start to suffer less you start to be you start to be engaged in the world as part of the world and this is what you are <laughs> it just hit me what you are so god bless you watch out for your mind and keep the faith because the faith is keeping you okay yep take good care okay.